Edgar Casey on Channeling the Higher Self Read by Alio Voices Chapter 1 What is Channeling? Today's Affirmation Every day my inner voice becomes louder and clearer. Learning that you, too, are a channel of spirit can be a means of spiritual awakening. The highest psychic realization is that God talks directly to human beings. What is channeling? In its most general sense, it's a means of transmission. The channel receives and passes along information. Inspiration and creativity are aspects of channeling. Being able to elevate others to higher states of consciousness and bring out the best in people. This is known as classic channeled metaphysical literature. We are all channels of divine energy. It is transmitting something which is beyond one's personal self. A channel may be asleep, in a meditation, in a trance, or awake while channeling. There are as many ways to channel as there are individuals that channel. A channeler brings forth information that's not part of the channeler's own learning or experience. Every day, in countless ways, you and I are channels of spirit, of ideas, and of resources that come from beyond our conscious personalities. Our channeling abilities have profound impact on our own lives and the lives of those around us. We can become aware of this fact. We can realize that we're channelers and can consider which types of channeling we wish to perfect and use. Rather than channeling without awareness of what we're doing, we can take a more active, creative role in our channeling. By doing so, we assume our birthright, our mission in life, to become a channel of blessings to others by the way we willingly choose to channel our energies. Chapter 2. Listen to Your Intuition, The Channel of Your Guardian Angel Today's Affirmation I am directly connected to infinite intelligence. Intuition is the highest form of psychic ability. Intuition as a channel of guidance. Intuition is information that comes to you from universal intelligence or God, and in this respect, it is referred to as a channel. It guides you on your path to your highest good. The Psychic Side of Intuition Intuition never comes randomly. There is always a purpose, a reason. Intuition is more than psychic ability. It draws conclusion and directs your actions like a faithful guide dog who knows you and knows what's best for you. Many times, Intuition guides our actions without our knowing it. All knowledge is within. Intuition is knowing from within. Two keystones of the teachings. One, knowing that all knowledge comes from within. Two, learning to look within. To demonstrate this, I have a story about Zen archery. A man by the name of Eugene Harrigal traveled to Japan to learn about Zen. Finally, Master Kenzo Awa, the revered archer, agreed to work with him. Eugene spent countless hours learning how to draw the long and very stiff Japanese bow. He shot at no target. He learned that the target was an inward one, a state of mind. Finally, during the fifth year, the master brought out a target and demonstrated shooting. The master could hit the target every time without hardly looking. He joked that his master had learned to shoot in his sleep. Later that evening at the master's studio, he revealed an amazing secret. In pitch black darkness, the master shot at a target twice and hit it both times dead center. The master explained that we believe we need our eyes to see because we believe the world is out there beyond us. If you separate yourself from the target, you then have to learn the trick of how to hit it with the arrow. The art is to become one with the target, allowing the arrow to return to its natural home. An archer who aims the arrow at the target is merely a trick shooter. 
the archer who becomes the target, is on the path to realizing Zen's great secret. The great secret to developing intuition is to follow the path because it leads to our true nature, one with God, not because we want to become psychic. Intention is everything. The secret of unitary oneness. We are all one. All of creation is one. There is one spirit or energy that unites all of creation. It connects all human beings with one another and with everything else in creation. Although we may appear to one another as separate, disconnected beings, we are each extensions of the Creator's spirit. What happens to one of us touches us all. There is a unified psychic ecology among all events in creation. God created human souls out of the Creator's own being. Each soul is a projection of God, in the same way our thoughts and images are projections of our mind. Although each soul has its individuality, all souls are one spirit. Each soul is like a miniature universe, like a drop of water in the ocean. Each person has intimate knowledge of all of creation. Modern science states that creation is holonomic. When you aim a laser beam at a holographic plate, the beam bounces off the plate and projects a three-dimensional picture in space. This projection looks solid and as real as the actual plate. Being psychic is an inherent, natural attribute of the soul. Intuition draws upon this universal knowledge that is psychically available to the soul. The superconscious mind. There is only one mind. This single, living reality is a universal mind that we all have in common. Mind is like the air we share. Although we each have our separate lungs to touch the air, there is only one air. Aspects of the conscious mind. The lowest form of the mind focuses on the physical world. Each of us appears distinctly separate from one another and is a channel of sensory information. Aspects of the subconscious mind. All subconscious minds of both the living and the dead, are in contact with one another. It remembers everything from all lifetimes, stored in the Akashic records located in the subconscious mind. It is a channel of telepathic information and gets knowledge from other people's thoughts and experiences. Aspects of the superconscious mind. A channel of clairvoyance. It gets information directly from the oneness of life and taps into the knowledge from universal mind. Intuition is a super channel, taking advantage of information coming through all the other channels. Developing Intuition Seven Major Principles 1. As you become consciously one with life, you become more consciously intuitive. 2. Empathy and love are the highest forms of attunement for intuition. 3. A need to know something stimulates intuition. 4. Intuitive knowledge comes from within. 5. Intuition requires an acceptance of what spontaneously comes from within, our first thought, feeling, or image. 6. Genuine intuitions are consistent with our highest values or ideals. 7. Honor your intuition by acting on them or affirming them. Imagine that your intuition is like a lightning rod. The lightning up in the sky is the infinite intelligence, the energy that seeks expression when it's needed. You want to bring the lightning down from the sky. If you don't provide a ground, a connection with the earth, the lightning won't come down your channel. Being prepared to put intuitions into service provides the necessary grounding. Spend time in nature. This is the best way to cultivate intuition, by spending time in nature. It's the perfect way to practice oneness with life. Birds are a common symbol of telepathic and intuitive messages. Hence the phrase, a little bird told me. Intuition is empathy. Harmony, resonance, and communion. 
When we attune to something, we become one with it, or in alignment with it. Choose something in nature to meditate on. It could be a flower like a rose, a tree, or maybe the sounds of nature, or even a bird or squirrel sitting quietly. Empathically merge with this energy and become one with it. For example, if you chose a rose, become a rose yourself. Begin to feel as the rose feels. From within yourself, imagery will arise that expresses your affinity with the rose. Thus you will come to know the rose intuitively. Intuitions often come as feelings. Sometimes they come as voices. In the book, the Natural Depth of Man, by Wilson Van Dusen. Wilson shared his experiences with mentally ill patients who heard voices. He learned that there are good voices and there are bad voices. The patients reported hearing different voices, voices that spoke with different tones and spoke different things. There were voices that were highly critical and said terrible things. He coached the person to speak back to those voices, to tell them to stop. They also heard voices that spoke kind words and had encouraging things to say. He helped the person to learn how to listen to those voices. These inner helpers could offer advice about the person's recovery. As mental health returned, the bad voices went away, but the good voices remained as helpers and guides. Anchor your channeling by being clear about your purpose for receiving information. By having some purpose focused on serving a need, we direct the active part of our channel in a constructive manner. The subconscious mind is like a strong cross current we have to swim through as we reach upward to the superconscious mind to access intuition. The subconscious mind may be filled with many different voices, good and bad. Our superconscious mind is filled with pure love, light, and harmony. Our purpose helps us attune to the highest source of guidance. Learning to listen to the still, small voice. Practice exercise. Begin with a difficult decision you have to make. Think through the alternatives. Consider your values and purposes, and make your best decision. Make a tentative commitment to follow through on that decision. Making that commitment is necessary to arouse your entire being in the contemplation of that decision. Hypothetical thoughts don't excite the intuitive faculty, for it's of a more practical bent. Next, sit down and get as quiet as you can within yourself. This step is the attunement. Focus on the feelings evoked by your highest values and your ideals. When you are in the frame of mind that is resonating with your ideals, ask yourself if your decision is a good one. There will be a response to that question within you, a yes or a no. That response is the voice of intuition. You may experience it as a voice, a feeling, or a thought. An answer will be there. It's usually the very first thing that comes to mind. Learning to trust intuition. Trust. Accepting the first thing that comes to mind is one of the hardest aspects of learning intuition. It involves trust. Tip. Accept your first response and save your evaluation, analysis, and criticism for later. Remember, intuition is like a loving friend. It's there to help and guide you toward your highest good. Our Guardian Angel. Intuition guides and guards us, inspires us, brings experiences of spiritual meaning. Sometimes it speaks, like an inner voice. Sometimes it brings feelings, like joy or dread. It nudges us. It guides us without our awareness. Its promptings may be subtle or loud. It is one face of the higher self. Intuition performs all the services we might expect of a guardian angel. In fact, within each of us is a guardian angel. Where's your guardian angel? Right inside of you. That's right. 
Our guardian angel resides where our portion of the superconscious mind becomes the one universal mind. It is that part of us that hasn't forgotten our oneness with God and knows of no separation from God. The guardian angel thus has no free will of its own, but serves only the will of God. The actions of our intuition aren't the response of our free will. They are involuntary, spontaneous responses of our guardian angel, drawing us ever closer to the experience of oneness. Chapter 3 Dreams The Nightly Channel of the Higher Self Today's Affirmation I will remember my dreams in the morning and any helpful messages they may hold. As we fall asleep, our intuition, our sixth sense, not only remains awake, but also becomes more expansive. There is no awareness of a separate self. There is simply being, deep, silent sleep, pure intuition, pure psychic oneness. Dreams as a Channel of Psychic Experience A study of 9,300 documented cases of psychic experiences showed that 57% of these occurred in dreams. Dreams are a channel of which we obtain important information about the future. 8% of the population has had a dream that foretold, in explicit detail, an event that later happened. Anything of importance that would ever happen to us, we would first preview in a dream. The Nightly Channel of the Higher Self Dreams are perhaps the most profound channels of the higher self. Six ways dreams function as a channel. One, they are themselves real experiences in the spiritual dimension. Two, they provide readings on our current life. Three, they provide us with a way to contact God. Four, they are inspirational, teaching us lessons. Five, they are creative, presenting solutions to problems. Six, they are psychic, seeing into the future. Dreams are also a channel of preventative health care and healing. While we sleep, our inner physician is always in attendance. Dreams may warn about developing illnesses, giving advice about treating health issues, and even provide direct healing. There is evidence that during the dream state, the body is receptive to new programming. The synthesis of new DNA molecules while dreaming could spark a reversal in a disease process. Consider reading the book, The Inner Eye, Your Dreams Can Make You Psychic, by Joan Windsor. Dreams as a Channel of Many Mysteries Our Dreaming Mind, History and Psychology, by Bob Van de Castle, is an encyclopedia of documented cases of wondrous dreams that have shaped the course of history. Mohammed had his first experience of religious calling in a dream. The Bible is full of examples of God talking to people in their dreams. Creative inspirations occur in dreams. Musicians have dreamed music. Artists dreamed art. Authors dreamed stories, and etc. In Dreams and Dreaming by Edgar Cayce, hundreds of dreams of ordinary people were interpreted. Dreams come from our subconscious mind, expressing our fears and wishes. Dreams also come from our superconscious mind, the work of our higher self. Meeting the Higher Self I was in the early stages of alcoholism when I had a dream about a drunkard in a sacred forest sanctuary that he was judging as he conversed with the caretaker. It turned out that the caretaker was the author's higher self, and the drunkard was actually himself. The lesson was to have more compassion for himself. An encounter with the higher self leads the dreamer through surprising turns into a deeper understanding of the meaning of one's problem. Who is the higher self? The higher self appears in many guises. It understands that there is a purpose in all things. It views all experiences as opportunities for growth and learning. The more you work with your dreams, the more you will realize there is a larger intelligence at work directing your life. An analogy. It's as if you are the driver of the car, but not its owner. At any time, however, 
you may hear a voice behind you declare, Turn right here. Such moments remind you that you are really only the chauffeur. Although you have to steer and brake the car, the true master of the vehicle is sitting in the back seat, your higher self. The higher self is the seeing eye of the soul, the soul's awareness of itself. The soul is our true identity. Ego has access to conscious mind. Higher self has access to subconscious and superconscious mind. And whether or not the higher self appears in your dreams, it is at work in many of them. There are many theories out there, and through my work, this is what I know to be true. We have an ego physical spirit, soul, and higher self. These are each separate entities, yet one energy. Our spirit is attached to our ego, and when we die, our physical form dissolves, but our spirit lives on in whatever egoic form we attained while on earth. Our soul is connected to our spirit. Our soul is more advanced, a more pure light, and holds memories of all of our lifetimes and evolves with every lifetime we experience. Our higher self is connected to our soul. It is our purest form. When we stop incarnating, our soul dissolves back into the oneness, and we are left with the higher self, which is always our connection to God, to Source, to Universal Intelligence, to the Oneness, the Sea of Awareness. What is a dream? As we fall asleep, our intuition, our sixth sense, not only remains awake, but also becomes more expansive. Our entire body, our whole being, begins to function as an ear that listens intuitively. We merge with creation and resonate with all that we hear. There is no awareness of a separate self. There is simply being. Deep, silent sleep. Pure intuition. Pure psychic oneness. If you dissolve into the universe during sleep, how do you come back in the morning as yourself? Fortunately, it's in the deep sleep that we are most closely attuned with our guardian angel consciousness. It guards us while we are asleep, protecting the pattern of our individuality. It beams us back to ourselves intact, so to speak. Our soul evaluates our life during sleep. Our soul examines our life during sleep and uses its superconscious perspective to determine if we are on course or not. The experience the soul has while we are asleep is what we remember as a dream. Whether or not our dreams reflect our soul's experience depends upon the level of our personal development. Anything we wish to know or experience can be safely obtained in our dreams. Dream Incubation Opening the Channel We can actively seek helpful dreams. The intention to apply what you already know is the seed of further inspiration. Dreams grow from what is on your mind while falling asleep. So be careful what you are thinking about as you drift off to sleep. Dreams help us become ourselves and create our own lives. Suggestion Actively seek helpful dreams by focusing on a question or solution to your problem before you fall asleep. Ask that you be shown through your dream how to solve the problem or what your next step to attaining success is. When you wake up, check in with yourself before you move your body. Remember. Every time your body moves, you forget more and more of your dream. Preparing to Channel a Dream of Guidance Write out your feelings about your question to get all your thoughts out on paper. Then, reduce your question to a single phrase that expresses the heart of the matter. Repeat this phrase to yourself as you fall asleep. Write a letter to your dreams asking for their advice. In your letter, Outline what you already know about the problem and what you're going to do about it. Invite your dreams to show you a better way. Put the letter under your pillow when you go to bed at night. As you fall asleep, imagine yourself following through on your own plan. A study done at an ARE conference showed that two out of five people who remembered a dream after using the pillow technique found the answer in the dream to be just as helpful as a psychic reading. 
Learning to Recall Dreams, an Exercise in Channeling. Learning to recall your dreams can be a good exercise in your own channeling abilities. 1. Before you fall asleep at night, repeat to yourself, I will remember my dreams in the morning and any helpful messages they may hold. 2. Lie still in bed when you wake up. 3. You may have no distinct images. That's okay. Be patient. 4. Become aware of subtle feelings. 5. Allow the feelings, colors, or shapes time to blossom into memories or images. 6. The information is there in how you are feeling. 7. Simply let it flow forth. 8. Trust. 9. Keep a journal by your bed and write down any images or thoughts that come to mind. Don't worry about remembering all the details. Pick out one thing that stands out in your mind. Maybe it's a color or an object. And as you move through your day, ask the question, What relevance does this have in my life? How can this help me? Channeling Dreams into Action In the application comes the awareness. In other words, practice, practice, practice. The best book on dreams is the one you write yourself. When we meditate, it improves our dream recall the following day. When we apply a dream insight one day, the next morning our dream will be clearer and easier to understand. Dreams are experiences of our higher self, creations of our soul. Simple Secrets to Learning to Interpret Your Dreams 1. Have a purpose for recalling your dream and write it down. 2. When you recall a dream, write it down. 3. Find something in the dream, anything that you think could be a clue. 4. Think of a way to test the validity of the clue or your understanding of it by some practical application. Find or make up an insight from the dream. 5. Do something constructive about it. For example, write down the results of your experiment and compare them with your own standards. If you do this, you will have a follow-up dream to further clarify or deny your conclusions. Practice Exercise 1. Record your dream. Write down whatever comes to mind. 2. Find something in your dream that you can make come true that day. If you saw the color red, wear something red that day. 3. Bringing something of our inner experience into our outer lives completes a circuit of energy. 4. Doing this is part of learning to channel. Chapter 4. The Creative Channel of the Mind. What we think, we become. Today's Affirmation. I create my own reality. If I don't like what I've created, I can simply create again. We live our lives as channels of energy. Energy isn't ours to own because it belongs to life itself, but it's ours to use, to channel. What we think, we become. Restlessness is the experience of energy we don't know how to channel. Psychology suggests that the energy arises from a desire but one we can't quite acknowledge. When we mull over our options for action, eventually one thought begins to take precedence, and soon we move into action. Thus, we've found a way to channel our energy. The three components to channeling our human being is 1. Input side. Given energy which comes from universal life force. 2. Output side. What turns the energy into action or experiences? 3. In the middle. The psychology of our mind. Our ideas about how to spend our energy. The formula of creation. Going through channels. How energy is channeled determines its effect. It's the fundamental process of creation. It originates from the creator. 
It's how the Creator, God, created all that exists. We use the same energy field that God does. God patterned this one energy, this universal life force. A multitude of patterns arose out of the mind of God and channeled that one energy into the forms of nature. The basic process of channeling is spirit is the life, mind is the builder, physical is the result. Patterning is like a film projector. The light bulb in the projector is the source of energy. It shines a neutral light like spirit. You place film in the projector, and the patterns on the film pattern the neutral light, shaping and coloring it. The film is like the mind, a source of patterns. The result is pictures on the screen. The physical manifestation, what we experience, is the result of the patterning of light, which comes from our thoughts. Ideas, channels of material reality. As a man thinketh, so is he. Proverbs 27 verse 3. Patterns we hold in our mind channel the life energy into physical expression. Ideas have their effect through their patterns. Ideas exist in another dimension, the fourth dimension. Ideas exist outside of time and space. Ideas are real in themselves and become real in the physical world as well. Ideas create our physical world. Personal expectations and attitudes affect how we experience events. How do ideas create our physical world? As we tune into an idea, it begins to shape our experience. Every moment of our lives, we're acting as channels of energy shaping events through the ideas we hold. Ideals and what spirit will you channel? What ideas will you channel into reality? Because the thoughts we have are so influential in our lives, we need to consider carefully which thoughts we give our attention to. It's a matter of values. It's important to establish our concept of ideals. What is your highest value? What is the ideal by which you choose to steer your life? Ideals are models of perfection. The perfect, perfect ten exists only as an idealized spirit form in the superconscious region of the mind. We will never find perfect, perfectly realized in physical form. Asking yourself, what is my highest value or ideal, is an exercise in raising your consciousness to the superconscious mind. The ideal is meant to stimulate emulation and guide our actions, but not to hold out hope of perfect success. Ideals are the parents of ideas. Ideals are the parents of ideas. Ideals are unachievable. If you can achieve it, it is an idea. Ideals continually motivate and inspire us. Ideas die once achieved. Values based on an ideal keep us going. Examples of ideals include love, harmony, and peace. Examples of ideas include wealth and happiness. Learning to express your ideal is one way to channel your higher self. The ideal of the Christ consciousness. The ideal choice of ideal is Christ consciousness. What makes Jesus special is his total awareness of his divinity within, his willingness to accept it, and to live it. To sin is to miss the mark. When we turn our backs on our awareness of oneness and take our physical being, our existence in the material world, as the prime reality, we miss the mark. We could define sin as self, meaning to focus on our separateness rather than on our oneness. An antidote to separateness is to focus on oneness. An antidote to feeling lonely is to forget yourself and reach out to someone else in love. This is the spirit of Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is an ideal that can provide continuous inspiration for a lifetime. If you find this term objectionable, search within yourself for your own sense of your ideal. What's important here is that you look within 
and become conscious of what is there, that your own intuition guide you to the ideal that you would choose to govern the spirit by which you live. Channeling the Ideals of the Higher Self In order to channel your higher self, you need to attune to an ideal, and then to set oneself aside so that the ideal may express itself. Ideals are the currency of the higher self. Ideals you set for yourself determine the qualities of the higher self that you will experience. I die daily so that Christ may live in me, said Paul. Set the ideal, then be spontaneous. Once your ideal is set, you can trust in the flow. You begin channeling the ideal of your higher self. Channeling Sexual Energy Sexual energy is the strongest physical force within the body. No sex act or sexual relation is necessarily bad in and of itself. Rather, it's the purpose or the desire that the sexual event is expressing that determines its value. Sexual energy is best served when used as a guide to an awareness of God and the divinity of another person. When used for your own self-gratification, it may lead to an unhealthy attachment. The same is true for channeling. If channeling is used for self-achievement or self-gratification, it likely will lead to confusion. If channeling is used to help oneself or someone else grow and expand, it will more likely be of value. For parents only, channeling new life. The conceiving of a child begins when a man and woman join forces to make a life together. What the parents think about, what's on their minds, their ideals, what's in their hearts is of essential importance in what soul they will attract to incarnate in the physical embryo. We have a great influence on shaping what enters through the combined parental channel. The law governing parental channeling and spirit entity channeling is like attracts like. What the parents love, the mental and spiritual environment they create, and their degree of consciousness of purpose will attract a like-minded soul. The Heavenly Home Home is the model and our closest experience on earth of the heavenly home. Making one's home like heaven on earth is a rewarding experience in channeling. What is an ideal home? It is a home with an ideal. Companionship A desire for companionship was God's motivation for creating souls, and companionship is an essential quality in the ideal home environment. It's easy to take our companions for granted, here and beyond. To remind ourselves of the heavenly delight of home companionship is to remember some of our most precious moments of channeling our simple, subtle pleasures of making room for someone else to share our life. Love is a channel of miracles. Love, the giving out of that within self. Love motivates every soul. Love is a law unto itself. Love is a channel of miracles because it can transcend the law of cause and effect. And love can break the rules. Forgiveness Each of us, in countless ways, find ourselves violated in some manner by someone else's inexcusable action. Their insensitive or hurtful act causes us to become angry. There's cause and effect, and it may continue like a row of falling dominoes, toward an inevitable conclusion. By an act of forgiveness, however, by accepting what happened and forgiving the person, you can break the chain. Forgiveness is one of God's creative powers to perform miracles. Every day, every moment of our lives, we give ourselves toward one goal or another. With every heartbeat, we channel love. And what our heart dwells upon, what our minds think about, we become or experience in our lives. We continually channel our energy, our love, our ideas, our ideals, our actions into creating life as we would have it. It's the most everyday, ordinary, and miraculous channeling we do. Chapter 5 Meditation 
channel of spirit. Today's affirmation. By quieting my mind, I allow answers to arise from within. Meditation is listening to the divine within. Two well-known channelers credit meditation as the womb that spontaneously gave birth to their channeling practice. To intentionally make contact with the higher dimensions, begin meditating. Meditation on the Breath, a Channel of Inspiration How to Meditate Use your breath, a word or image, as a focus point. Concentrate on your focus, and whenever your mind strays, return to your point of focus. Begin by simply breathing, and study your breath for a moment. As you become aware of your inhalations and exhalations, allow the exhale to bring you into relaxation. Allow your breath to just happen. Don't try to control it. It breathes me. Watching the breath is an ancient Zen Buddhist technique to meditate and an important channel of inspiration. You are learning to allow the breath of life, the spirit, to flow through you. Become a channel of awareness. Become aware of the silent witness. The little eye is focused on thoughts and feelings whereas the silent eye is focused on witnessing. The silent witness is the first level of consciousness of the higher self. Be still and know that I am God. How to Meditate A Fuller Understanding of I Am Use your breath, a word or image, as your focus point. Concentrate on your focus, and whenever your mind strays, return to your focus. Place your intention to stay focused in gentle opposition with your mind's natural tendency to wander. These two forces meet and gradually cancel each other out. This leaves the presence of I am awareness to reveal itself in the background. This I am awareness leads to a far greater awareness. The higher consciousness within is not above you. God isn't above us, but within us. Raise your consciousness within self, and then higher self or God meets you there. As you go within, become aware of the vibrations. Higher, lower, light, dense, subtle, coarse. Follow the path of calmness in search of higher vibrations. Search for the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a particularly fine vibration. Immediately there's a feeling of moving higher within, seeking answers from within. We can contact an awareness that knows answers to the questions that confront us. All knowledge is within. Meditation is a very portable guide that travels within you everywhere you go. Ask your higher self for guidance. If you have a question or decision, commit to an answer on paper saying it aloud. This begins the channeling process. Next, enter into meditation and focus on your ideal, maybe it's love, for 20 minutes or so. When you come out of meditation, ask your question or stake your decision and become aware of any insights that arise. Meditation on an ideal. A lot more goes on in meditation than what you might expect. It's a time where other dimensions, other realities, other vibrations become an influence on the person. Research has proven that meditation improves psychic sensitivities. Other minds, including those of the dead, as well as other forms of spirit energy, have easier access to our mind. While meditating, it's important to attune yourself to the highest vibrations. Imagine surrounding yourself with love and light. This creates a boundary that separates and protects us from anything that's not in accordance with our intentions. Attuning to an ideal. Whatever you focus on in meditation, it's like tuning your mind to that particular channel. You receive the energies of that wavelength in a pure concentrated form. When we meditate on an ideal, the pattern of energy contained in that ideal actually affects us. We become a channel for spiritual energy to influence our being. Meditation and the Book of Revelation 
The Lord's Prayer, as taught by Jesus, is actually a formula for patterning the opening of the psychic centers. When Apostle John's centers opened in the pattern, the endocrine glands functioned in harmony to allow God's consciousness to fully inhabit John's body and to be present in his awareness. The book of Revelation describes a second coming of Christ. It's the birth of the Christ consciousness in John, in each of us. God's incarnation in John's body, as was the case with Jesus, becomes a totally conscious experience. The body is the temple. The body is the temple. It's where we meet with God. And you don't need to become a health freak first. It's not what we put into our bodies that defiles us anyway, but what comes out of our bodies by way of our thoughts, speech, and actions. It's not the substance itself that causes harm, but what we digest of what we eat. This principle is similar to the dream principle. It's not what we learn that changes us. It's what we apply from what we learn. The use of scent, chanting, music, and breathing exercises can aid us in our meditations and help us invoke what is within us. Meditation is channeling. In meditation, we channel the life energy, the creative forces themselves, as they quicken our awareness of our higher self. Meditation is a process of channeling God's energy through us in a pattern that's most in tune with our consciousness of that higher self. Each time we tune within and open ourselves to the channel of higher consciousness, we take another step forward in being able to express that awareness in our lives. Chapter 6. Inspirational Writing Today's Affirmation I am healed by the divine love of universal spirit. The creative power of God's words can be summed up with five simple words. First, there was the word. Inspirational Writing A Course in Miracles by Helen Schuchman was channeled completely through inspirational writing. Jonathan Livingston Siegel by Richard Bach is another example. It's not uncommon to hear authors talk about how they ride creative impulses in their writing. Channeled writing might even feel like ghost writing. Being a constructive channel. Attune yourself to an ideal, like love or peace, for about five to ten minutes or more. Allow your whole being, mind and body, to resonate with the spiritual energy of the ideal. Then allow your thoughts to flow directly on the paper. Your writing will reflect and express that spirit or ideal. Here we have inspired, constructive writing, a channel of the higher self. Dissociation and automatisms, a channel of the subconscious mind. The process of getting up and getting dressed is mildly dissociated from our conscious mind. All the little details of our actions occur as automatisms. Reflex actions directed by the subconscious mind. All subconscious minds are in contact with one another. The subconscious mind isn't only a channel of information about your unconscious feelings. It's also a channel of telepathy. Automatisms can express your subconscious feelings and more. They can also express subliminally perceived telepathic information from the living and the dead. Automatic Writing versus Inspirational Writing Handwriting is another source of automatism. We do it automatically, without thinking. Many famous writers have used automatic writing as a means to channel information. For example, Ruth Montgomery and her autobiography. An example of a disassociated automatism is the use of Ouija boards, which the author personally discourages. Writing automatically with the subconscious mind as a source of the material results primarily simply in the production of channeled material. What comes through may affect the person, but there's no growth in the process itself. It's more like learning a new trick. Inspirational writing comes from the superconscious mind, which is attuned to your higher self. Inspirational writing promotes growth in consciousness. 
Meditating on an ideal before inspirational writing allows the ideal to serve as both a magnet and a filter for what will pass through the channel. Experiment with inspirational writing. Practice. One way to get started is to simply begin writing out your ideal. Perhaps you begin with a single word or phrase. Maybe you'll find yourself simply writing that again and again. Whatever you write, it doesn't matter. For example, maybe my ideal is to be the best I can be, so I keep writing that over and over again. I am aware of what I am writing, but I don't judge it. I don't do anything to interfere with what my hand might feel inclined to write. And then I find that the phrase begins evolving and changing. I can be my best. The best in me can come through me. Etc. I feel I am starting to warm up and begin trusting more in the process. Tips Let go of any demands on yourself for performance. Be playful. Let go of the need to write something of importance. Allow yourself to flow. Don't take it too seriously. Forget about whether or not you're doing it right. Forget about grammar and punctuation. Most people hesitate before they write waiting for inspiration, evaluating, censoring, or filtering your thoughts before you write will keep you from writing in an inspirational flow. Write anything and nothing in particular. Just play with the words. It's a good way to get started. It's easier to receive ideas while writing than by just sitting waiting for the ideas to arrive. Starting the flow is the hardest part. The first words are the hardest to get out. After that, you'll find a rhythm and flow that's right for you. Focus on your feeling of attunement to your ideal and let it express itself in your writing. If you can, withhold from reading your writing for 30 days, but keep writing. The Inspired Word and Creativity When the emphasis is on the process of tuning into your feelings, not on being inspired with holiness or wisdom, the pleasure of inspirational writing is available to all of us. Words bring our awareness into the consciousness of being. Playfulness adds another link between the inspirational writing and creativity. The more we can accept ourselves as a channel in the awake state, the more we can realize that we need only be ourselves, who we really are, to channel our higher self. Learn from your breathing. Meditation on the breath can become a basis for learning inspirational writing. A willingness to trust in inspirational writing without first knowing what you will write requires a meditative frame of mind. Inspirational writing is a way to channel higher consciousness, but automatic writing is trick shooting. There are three modes of breathing. 1. Controlled. We can choose how to breathe by controlling the length and fullness. Two. Automatic. When we don't pay attention to our breath, it happens automatically by itself. We have voluntarily suspended our interference with the breath momentarily, yet we could assume control at any time. 3. Inspired. We are consciously allowing our breathing to express itself naturally while we watch. By becoming calm and relaxed, by trusting our breath, we allow ourselves to be inspired. 3. Modes of Writing. 1. Controlled. Much of our writing happens this way. We decide what to write and how to write it. 2. Automatic. Writing without awareness of the act, the handwriting happens by itself controlled by the subconscious mind. 3. Inspired. Maintaining an awareness of what we are writing, we allow the writing to proceed on its own, to just happen. We don't decide upon thoughts to record. We just allow them to express themselves, watching our thoughts reveal themselves as we write. Answers from the Higher Self A genuine need is the greatest stimulant for the flow. Meditation shapes the flow. A special value of inspirational writing is that we can use a form of role-playing to get answers from our Higher Self. An Alternative Approach to Channeling One. Imagine what it would be like to be God. 2. Pose a question to yourself. 3. Imagine God hearing that question. 4. Allow yourself to answer the question as God might. 
Dream incubation is a way to channel. 1. Imagine some person as the personification of your highest ideal, real or imagined. 2. For your meditative attunement, allow yourself to imagine what it feels like to be this person. 3. Write down those feelings. 4. Now pose a question to that person. 5. Use inspirational writing to receive an answer from that person. 6. Ask for clarification if it is needed. Wrestle with the angel, and it will bless you. Chapter 7. Artistic Channels of Creativity Today's Affirmation I trust my higher being to lead me along the right path. When the real music comes to me, the music of the spheres, the music that surpasses understanding, that has nothing to do with me, because I'm just the channel. The only joy for me is for it to be given to me and transcribe it, like a medium. Those moments are what I live for. John Lennon Artistic Channels of Creativity It is the arts that provide the channeling opportunities for the greatest expression of spiritual truths. Our inherent creativity is thus both a powerful and fun way to explore and develop our ability in channeling our higher self. All artists give credit to flashes of insight, the spontaneous flow of the imagination, when they are channels of creativity. We already are channels of creative energy. The challenge seems to be for us to accept that gift and develop its expression. Art is the way we can manifest our spirit in the material world, said George Winston. The Temple Beautiful were in Egypt 10,500 B.C. The purpose of these temples was to either purify people of disease or initiate them into the mysteries by raising their consciousness through the arts. The arts were actively employed as a holistic mode of education and transformation. Of all sensory effects, odor has the most powerful influence on the body. Through chanting and dancing with the proper music, One's conception of one's body in the material world can change to the point that one becomes aware that everything consists of vibration. In this manner, a person can learn how the energy is the basic reality and how to pattern it toward a desired manifestation. There is no more powerful method for revealing spiritual truths than the arts. Psychologists have verified that listening to music can alleviate migraine headaches. They have also verified that the aroma of spiced apples can lower blood pressure, and the aroma of peaches can reduce pain. Clearly, art can affect consciousness. It can inspire us, evoke emotions, or create higher emotions. Ideals, Art, and Creativity There is a close association in folklore and research that closely links genius with madness. The tension between profound creativity and madness provides another lesson in channeling. Although the art's the greatest channel for the realization of spiritual truths, we must always keep in mind that no other channel can unleash such destructive influences. Opening the channel when the adrenals are overstimulated, as in fear and anger, is much more hazardous than an overstimulated sex center. Such stimulation is much more provocative of mental disturbances and the anguish of obsessive, compulsive states of mind than sexual stimulation. Researchers have even studied the effects of film footage on people. Some footage was of the Nazi concentration camps, which weakened viewers' immune systems, leaving them more vulnerable to disease. Other footage of Mother Teresa's charitable works strengthened their immunity to disease. Ideals expressed in movies affect our bodies in subtle but profound ways. When opening ourselves to the channel of creative influences, ideals also serve as a safety anchor. Make sure you anchor yourself in love or another ideal, as always, when channeling your higher self. A Spiritual Appreciation for Art We can use the artist's perception of the world as a stimulant to our own perception. Listening to music can transform our emotions. Music can help us bridge the gap between the physical body and the infinite reaches of consciousness. Music also serves as a bridge between changes in activities to help change our mood 
when we need to relax or when we need to get up and work. It can also help us experience our feelings more clearly, deal with them better, and ultimately change our mood. Listening to music is a wonderful way to open the channel to inspiration and visions. Nature as Master Teacher of Creativity Tune in to the sound of music in nature. If we can attune ourselves to nature's music, we will be getting closer to hearing the music of the spheres, that celestial music played by angels. When you're in nature, find your own way to hum or make sounds that blend in with nature's sounds. In this way, you attune yourself to the vibrational frequency of nature. You can learn something about channeling from examining and reflecting upon any aspect of nature you meet. Attune yourself to animals, insects, or birds. Become one with their energy. Participate in the arts in the spirit of play. Of all the arts, we carry the ability of music expression with us at all times. A wonderful channeling exercise is to sing to yourself in the shower or on your way to work. Our voice is the highest vibration we can achieve with our physical body. Chanting also allows you to channel with your voice a surprising amount of expression from your higher self. Quiet or silent humming can also be a form of prayer. It's great practice to cultivate your willingness to flow with your spontaneous, improvised self-expression. Creating Life Seals This is similar to a vision map a personal poster displaying symbols related to your ideal, your feeling for your higher self, and of your soul's purpose for this life. Draw or make a collage. To begin, ask yourself, what is my highest ideal? What are the most important qualities of my higher self? What do I consider to be my purpose in life? What talents do I have? Include your dreams, symbols, or images. The placement of your symbols holds meaning as well. Left represents where we have come from and what we're bringing with us. Right represents where we are headed. The center represents the essential focus of this life. The top area represents the ideals, values, or a guiding wisdom. And the bottom represents raw energies or other natural resources to develop or our foundation. The purpose of a life seal is to stimulate yourself, to evoke a sense of higher purpose and higher consciousness, to serve as a reminder of your higher self, and it's like a commercial for your spiritual life. Creativity and Channeling Practicing being in the spirit of creativity, owning our birthright of unique self-expression, is very important in developing the awareness of channeling abilities. The word recreation or recreation means rest and renewal, play and creation. Its essential value is in teaching us the joy of being a channel of expression, a channel that can express in a manner like no other, the living, the presence of the higher self. Chapter 8 the visionary channel of the imagination. Today's affirmation. Universal love and abundance is circulating in my life. In order not to have to reincarnate, one must learn to do good for its own sake. From the boy who saw true spirit guide. The boy who saw true is the private journal of a young British boy who kept a diary of his psychic, visionary experiences from the time he could write until he was almost twenty years old. The boy had the ability to see people's thoughts. They appeared as images surrounding the person. He could also read people's energy and see what was coming in their future. This takes us back to the principle that thoughts are things. They're alive. They affect those around us. Thoughts are one element of the unseen forces and can be seen through the imagination. Many of our dreams are actual visits with others. People who have died do not become all-knowing spirits. They only have access to the same wisdom we do on earth. People don't become smarter after they die, except to know that there is life after death. The boy who saw true 
asked his elder brother's spirit guide how a soul might come to not have to return for another life. The reply was, besides paying off debts and not doing any more evil, one must learn to do good for its own sake. Strong desires act like a boomerang. You hurl them forth into time in the shape of desires, and they come back to you in the shape of fulfillment. Incompleted strong desires bring you back to earth to fulfill them. The Etheric Field of the Imaginative Forces The physical world is but a fleeting shadow, an effect, an end product of the mind's patterned projection of spiritual energy. Imagination is the psychic, intuitive foundation, the receptive and informative background of the ability of the physical eyes to see. We do our seeing with the mind's eye, not the eyeballs. Psychologists agree that perceiving is a creative act. It's the same source that creates manifestations that also experiences them. It's why the word visionary means both perceptive and creative. Perceiving and creating reality are soulmates. Psychics read people's energy. We see in the situation of the boy, from the boy who saw true, seeing the thought forms sticking to his visitor. These thought forms are etheric patterns of the imaginative forces in the visitor's subconscious mind. These patterns are about to be manifested in the visitor's physical life in events that will soon come to pass. With his imagination, the boy sees, through the channel of the subconscious mind, these thought forms and is able to predict the visitor's future. The Creative Power of Visualization The act of visualization holding the product of imagination firmly in mind and acting as if it will materialize, harnesses and shapes the imaginative forces to create its physical reality. Medical science has now confirmed that we can use mental imagery to control the workings of the body. Imagery is the language of the subconscious mind, that portion of the mind which rules the body and steers most of our actions. Imagery is the process of experiencing in patterns rather than by linear logical thought. To make use of this power, set an ideal, visualize a goal, then act as if it were coming to pass. The Psychic Inspired Imagination When you give the imagination free reign, it proves to be inspired or psychic. You may feel like you're just making it up, creating it yourself. Creativity, the psyche, and inspiration all have the same source. Patterns from someone else's thoughts and feelings could be influencing your own. ESP researchers have found that one person's thoughts can exert a subliminal influence upon the daydream patterns of another person. The daydreamer doesn't even suspect it. Beware, subconscious minds are connected and can influence us. Control, no, but influence, yes. Developing imagination through pretending. Many fear they are not visual learners. This fear is unfounded. We all visualize. We can't see without imagery. What most people mean when they say they can't visualize is that their visualizations aren't as clear as what they see with their eyes. The solution is easy. Just pretend. The following is a pretend exercise you can use. Remember. Children pretend all the time. Kids don't concern themselves with how vivid their pretending is, or whether it's occurring through images or thoughts, or even that their pretending is different from reality. They're too busy playing in their pretend world to notice any of that. They become absorbed in their pretending. It becomes real. How can we distinguish between wishful thinking and psychic information? It's the role of ideals to help us invoke imagination in the service of truth rather than our desires. The Role of the Higher Self Roles can be tools we use to enter certain states of awareness. When we put on the mask, we hide our own face. It allows us to get out of the way, to forget about our own personality. When we put on the costume, it allows us to attune to the spirit of the role. It's like stepping inside the ideal itself and becoming it. Channelers who ask their spirit guides whether or not they're really spirits or a figment of their imagination 
often receive the reply that it doesn't matter. The two alternatives are the same. Channeling Visionary Guidance from the Higher Soul You know what it's like to have an imaginary conversation with a family member, friend, or boss at work. Why not have one with an inspired teacher? Playing music can help intensify the process. Imagination is a wonderful channel of wondrous teachings and guidance. Meditation teaches you to become a channel of the spirit of inspiration. With your imagination, you have a vehicle that knows no limits. To intensify your channeling experience further, you can use self-hypnosis where we enter the domain of trance channeling. The following are additional questions and exercises. 1. Tell your mouth to become wet. Say to yourself, salivate, over and over. See how much response you get. Now try using an image. Imagine holding a lemon, or half a lemon, in your hand. Imagine squeezing it until beads of juice appear on its surface. Bring that lemon to your mouth and suck the juice. If you can imagine it, you'll see what I mean. Your mouth gets wet. Although a thought only makes you think, an image touches and affects your whole being. 2. Pretending to visualize. Instead of trying to visualize your arm immersed in warm water, pretend that your arm is immersed in warm water. Take a moment to put your arm on the chair or on the table. Then pretend that your arm is resting in a dish of warm water. What does it feel like to pretend that your arm is resting in a dish of warm water? If you examine your thoughts and feelings closely, you'll discover that perhaps you feel that your pretending isn't very vivid. If so, what is it that you're paying attention to that helps you feel that your pretending isn't vivid? 3. Role-playing A Imagine being your higher self, and through role-playing, ask and answer questions between yourself and your higher self. Attune to your ideal. Set self aside, and let the ideal express itself. Imagine what it would be like, then, to play the role of someone who personified the ideals of your higher self. What may start as pretending and acting becomes a channel of a quality of spirit. Imagination becomes real. Role playing B. Think of a special place where you'd like to meet with your higher self, figure, or guardian angel. Imagining being in that place will put you in the mood of your ideal. While you're there, basking in the wonderful vibrations of your power spot, imagine seeing your higher self, figure, or guardian angel approach you. Experience the person's special qualities and what it's like to be in the person's presence. Pour your heart out to your higher self, expressing what's on your mind. Then simply listen as your higher self responds. Chapter 9. Who's There? Identifying the Spirit Who Speaks. Today's Affirmation. I easily discern messages from my ego and messages from my higher self. There is being awakened within self a power, an influence. Do not allow this to be directed by an entity that does proclaim himself or herself as being the guide. Why? For, as indicated, the abilities have been such in self and the soul development that to call upon the infinite is much greater, much more satisfying, much more worthwhile in the experience of an individual soul than being guided or directed merely by an entity outside of that self that, as self, is being in a state of transition or development. Identifying the Spirit Who Speaks A tribe in Malaysia, the Samai, consider spirits to be mischievous and untrustworthy. The Samai know that the spirits can often lead people astray or into danger. When the Samai were asked why, they said, It's because the spirits are jealous. They're dead, while the people are alive. According to some, the history of spiritualism began on March 31, 1848, in Hydesville, New York. There had been mysterious rapping sounds in the home of the Fox family. They discovered it was a spirit trying to communicate with them. He used a rapping code. Two raps for no and one rap for yes. The rapper claimed to have been murdered, identified the name of the murderer, 
and indicated it had been buried in the cellar. This was confirmed. Within two years, a new sort of religion had been born called spiritualism. Parapsychology tests the spirits. Parapsychology is the scientific study of paranormal events. Such research will never be able to prove or disprove the reality of life after death. Instead, it led to some convincing demonstrations of the telepathic ability of the medium spirit guides. They did a study to prove or disprove Eileen Garrett, a well-respected medium who channeled Ovani. The results showed that Mrs. Garrett, and her Ovani voice at least, had ESP ability, ESP meaning extrasensory perception. But it didn't prove whether Ovani was in fact who he claimed to be, a spirit from the dead. In mediumship, a person enters an altered state of consciousness and delivers information about the afterlife and the condition of those deceased. The medium is in communication with spirits. I believe in our day and age, we refer to mediumship as transferring information from spirit to person, and trans-channeling is when a spirit speaks directly through a person's mouth. More Perspectives on Mediumship and the Subconscious Mind Thoughts are things. Those thoughts live on in eternity. There is also the continued activity, which is the soul's spirit journey in other dimensions of being. Communication across the channel of the subconscious mind operates on the principle of affinity, that is, like attracts like. When we channel the thought patterns of the deceased, or recall their past life memories, we do so in a selective manner that most resonates with our own subconscious feelings, motivations, and needs, aka filters. The bottom line is that channeling information through a third party is only about 80% reliable because of the interference with the medium's filters. The best thing we can do for our departed loved ones is to pray for them and telling them, what are you doing listening to me instead of focusing on the light and going on? The dead have little to teach the living. The dead have impressive ESP powers, but beware of mistaking this for higher wisdom. Pursuing communication with the dead distracts all concerned from their own inner development. It is for that reason primarily that I would strongly caution anybody against pursuing mediumship, particularly if it is for vain or shallow or self-gratifying reasons. The Psychoanalysis of Spirit Guides Eileen once asked a friend to interview her spirit guides. She wanted to learn more about their true nature. Were they actually spirits who lived before? Or were they part of her own personality as psychologists believed? The spirits explained that they are intimately connected with Eileen, and to get rid of them would be to get rid of her, and vice versa. The spirits also said it's not appropriate to ask who is speaking, but better to ask what quality of consciousness or level of reality is being expressed at the moment. For added reference, when the author channeled his higher self, he often experienced his information coming through an old man figure. Eileen's friend determined it's not accurate to conclude that such figures are subpersonalities of the channel. We're contacting a level of the mind that is transpersonal, that is impersonal, that goes far beyond the channel's own personality. It's more accurate to think of them as personifications. For example, Mother Teresa is the personification of charity and goodwill. Rambo is the personification of courage. The wise old man symbol personifies the mind's capacity to bring knowledge and insight from the depths. The wise old man is a role the mind plays when it creates pearls of wisdom and brings them to the surface. Edward Ettinger, a Jungian psychiatrist, commented that our desire to expand our consciousness comes from the innate urge of life to realize itself consciously. For Eileen, Uvani is a doorkeeper, a protector, a role that served to protect the open channel from the very many voices that would come through. Ovani pointed out that any entity, enthusiasts, foolish ones, anguished ones, can come through when the channel is open, so that he needs to guard the opening for the protection of the instrument. 
Eileen's friend also determined that there were two aspects of the four energies that Eileen channeled. One, psychic abilities, accessing information, and two, being an oracle, delivering wisdom. Two of the spirits demonstrated psychic abilities, while the other two functioned more as oracles. The purpose of channeling is to bring new meaning. When human beings struggle and wrestle with the ultimate questions about nature, about life, the principle of the word, or what he calls the inner principle of meaning, will be present there in the struggle. If the human being can persevere in this struggle, the principle of the word will help bring inspiration or insights to that person. Why have you come? When Eileen's friend asked her spirit guides this question, they responded with, to instruct us of the true nature of our reality and to remind us of our talents so that we might take a more constructive role in shaping the future of the planet. The oracle level of the mind speaks an unchanging message. The darker side of trance channeling. Whatever possessed me? There are many ways we can be possessed. Our own regressed unconscious impulses influencing us. Cultural propaganda hypnotizing us with assumptions or values that aren't necessarily true. Intuitive urges based on subliminal telepathic information. The influence of the wishes of our friends and family members. The whispering of spirits. Ideas, feelings, and needs in the subconscious mind can exert irresistible influences on our behavior, regardless of how they get there. Whatever the source, whether it's advertisements or spirits, there is always an affinity between the possessor and the possessed. We all have a darker side, and the influence is drawing out our darkness, giving us that extra push. Just as deep inside our psyche there rises the spirit of wisdom, personified as higher self, so there is the spirit of evil, sometimes personified as the devil. Evil Evil isn't a separate force. All force is the one energy of God, but that it's a pattern of use of that one force for personal indulgence at the expense of the whole, a willful and knowing rebellion against God's will. It's a powerful transpersonal pattern, existing both within and beyond the individual personality. Nothing can possess us against our will. Self-indulgence can weaken our aura, where potential spirits can move in. Other examples of weakened auric energy fields. Improper meditation practices. Dissociated states of mind. Accidents. Alcohol. Illness. Extreme emotional states, such as rage or chemical intoxication. Caution. Given these potential sources of possession, from the ordinary to the demonic, it seems important that we give careful thought to how we open ourselves to the psychic, transpersonal, and potentially turbocharged energy of the psyche. In regards to channeling the higher self, the author decided against using a spirit guide to channel information per se. Not that he never used a spirit guide, but he left that decision to the will of God. The author's main focus was always that we not be diverted from growing in our own awareness of developing our own higher consciousness. We all appreciate the advice of developing an unnecessary despondency on a crutch. It undermines our own growth and realizing our own potential. By seeking the highest within, we provide the best possible channel available. Chapter 10. Evaluating Channeled Guidance Today's Affirmation I have divine power within me that creates miracles in my life. When the student is ready, the teacher, whether an inner teacher or an external one, will appear. Evaluating Channeled Guidance Main Ingredients of Channeling Inspired Wisdom 1. Having a genuine need to know. 2. Making the necessary attunement. 3. Having the ability and intention to put that guidance into service. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Readiness involves both the person's ability to recognize guidance and to be able to apply it. Getting guidance from someone else's own psychic abilities can help you recognize your own. Learning to evaluate channeled guidance 
is part of the process of channeling. Casey's Guidance Heuristic Heuristic is a method of discovery. It's based upon the assumption that there's no perfect absolute truth, only better and more workable approximations to it. The Heuristic Mantra Pray as if everything depended on God. Work hard as if everything depended on you. Do your best with what you have available, and more will be given. Casey's Law In the application comes the awareness. What is the question? Identifying the appropriate question is very important, as the question will influence the answer. A vague question results in a general answer. It is the desire of the seeker, the particular quality of the vibrational pattern of the need to know that stimulates and focuses the energy from which the guidance is created. Ideals and Purposes When it comes to evaluating guidance, especially the results of applying the guidance, the outcomes that do result will ultimately be compared with the original purpose or intention. Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Set a purpose or intention for contacting your higher self. Thinking about possibly satisfying outcomes helps clarify the purpose. Values are important and need to be considered carefully in preparing for guidance. This is where the emphasis on ideals comes into play. Ideals serve as a guiding star. Giving consideration to ideals when contacting your higher self needs to be a top priority, not only because of the importance of aligning our purpose with our values, but also because of the quality of the energy that is activated. An example of an ideal is, truth is beauty. Simply meditating briefly on the ideal oftentimes solves the problem. When presenting the question to another psychic, time spent contemplating the ideal has a tremendous effect on the quality of information that comes through the psychic. Consider the source. Consider all of the possible sources of information. Desire, expectations, the subconscious, as well as universal awareness. All of these sources can affect the message differently than the source of highest guidance. If a psychic says, I'm not able to get anything on this question, it's a good sign that the psychic respects the process and is working from integrity. It's universally true that what blocks us from the awareness of all wisdom is our sense of self. Higher beings usually speak as if they are personifications of eternal principles, and manifested as identities and only for the sake of the listener. Higher beings usually pay less attention to the pain and feelings of your personal situation and speak in the language of universal truths. Higher beings usually are compassionate and insistent on the reality that we are spiritual beings and we create our own reality. Higher beings usually are patient and forgiving. They usually orient you to your spiritual destiny by focusing on what's your next step. They usually speak in humble tones and have a great sense of humor. Evaluating the guidance. Don't get lost in trying to pinpoint the exact source of channeled guidance. Focus instead on determining what, if any, of the guidance is valuable. Ask yourself, does the guidance make sense? Does it speak to the situation? Is it workable? Does it seem constructive? Do you have a positive response to it? Examine the guidance from the point of view of the ideal that you set. If it doesn't meet the standard of your ideal, either you should forget it, or else you may decide that you have some soul-searching to do. Assuming the guidance passes these preliminary tests, seek a second opinion. Never put all your eggs in one basket. Never rely on one single external channel as a sole source of information. Look for commonalities and for correlations in the information. Evaluating Guidance 1. Compare the results of a psychic reading with your inspirational writing and then your dreams. 2. Form an opinion. 3. Take it into meditation. The Final Test Applying the Guidance Test guidance by applying it in practice. Determine if the guidance works. Try it out. Test it and see. Good ideas are a dime a dozen, but one idea put to good use is golden. Don't ask the question if you're not ready to take responsibility for the answer. 
Sometimes you don't know what you need to know. There is no question at first, just a problem, a sense of unease, difficulty, or pain. By yourself, or with the help of a good listener, it's possible to start with the felt sense of frustration or conflict to determine what is needed by way of guidance. Perhaps the process would begin simply by a statement of facts. I'm very dissatisfied with blank, and I want to know what to do about blank. It helps to get more specific. What exactly is bothering you and why? What are you seeking in a solution? What are your goals? What are your constraints? Chapter 11. Using Hypnosis to Become a Trance Channel Today's Affirmation Whenever my thoughts are not in alignment with my purpose, the universal force sends me a sign. The study of the self may best be done by suggestive forces to the body through hypnosis. Entering hypnosis is basically a process of deep relaxation while maintaining a quiet awareness. It's much like what we experience in meditation, with the possibility of adding further suggestions to open the imagination to deeper channels of the mind. The Suggestibility of the Subconscious During Hypnosis Hypnosis is a state of heightened suggestibility, of communicating directly with the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind operates on the principle of suggestion. It accepts any statement as being true. The conscious mind operates on the principle of reasoning. It rejects any statement until analyzed and evaluated. It seduces the attention of the conscious mind and redirects it elsewhere. Relaxation Relaxation aids in the process of hypnosis. As the body relaxes, the sensory system also relaxes, and the conscious mind grows dim, similar to falling asleep. The difference between sleep and hypnosis is the conscious mind doesn't dissolve because the hypnotist's voice has captured its attention and gives it a restful focus. If the hypnotist were to stop talking for an extended length of time, the conscious mind would lose focus and fall asleep. Bypassing the conscious mind to access the subconscious mind. As the person relaxes more fully and the dimming conscious mind rests upon the pillow of the hypnotist's voice, the subconscious becomes uninhibited and opens up to accept suggestion. Remember the subconscious mind accepts any suggestion, so the key to hypnosis is to bypass the conscious mind through relaxation and connect with the subconscious mind through positive suggestions. It's very easy to do. Whatever the hypnotist suggests can be vividly imagined by the subconscious mind, and what it thus imagines, it takes as reality. Learning Self-Hypnosis Through Relaxation Imagery You can learn to enter the hypnotic state yourself by learning to respond to your own suggestions. Focusing on images suggestive of relaxing is the basic procedure. Hypnosis and ESP All subconscious minds are in contact with one another. If hypnosis is a means of communicating directly with the subconscious mind, we should expect that extrasensory perception would be more pronounced during hypnosis than during the normal waking state. There has been some research on telepathic hypnosis, whereby hypnotists can connect with your mind telepathically at great distances, similar to distance Reiki. Sending people thoughts of encouragement is a natural and positive use of telepathic suggestion. Hypnosis often increases telepathic abilities. Hypnotic imagery, a channel of self-diagnosis. We could diagnose ourselves if we would turn within. The inner wisdom figure is an image representation of a state of consciousness, an internal awareness that has proven therapeutic value. Once again, we see the value and power of the personification. Using an image of a person or being can unlock hidden powers within the mind. Self-Diagnosis 1. Enter a light hypnotic state using self-hypnosis. 2. Next, imagine being on top of a mountain searching for a path down. 3. Descend down the mountain and discover a secret door leading into the depths of the mountain. 4. Door number 1. Open the door and enter an atmospheric vibration of renewal and restoration. 5. Door number 2. 
Looking around, you see another door with a sign upon it that reads, The One Who Knows Health. 6. Open door number 2 and meet a person or being who knows everything about your body. 7. You sit down in front of this knowing being and ask questions. 8. The being answers your questions with colors, shapes, words, phrases, images, etc. The Power of Hypnotic Role-Playing Role-playing allows us to take on the characteristics of the role, to channel whatever characteristics the role suggests. Role-playing is a process of pretending. It engages the channel of the subconscious mind through an act of the imagination. By neutralizing the conscious mind and providing more direct access to the subconscious, hypnosis can increase the power of role-playing to an incredible degree. Role-playing also shows the power of personification, how proposing an image of a being can open a profound channel of inspiration. Channeling is an expression of the channel's own growth in consciousness. An outline of how to journey within. You can imagine moving along a path of light as a tiny dot outside of the physical body. Shapes and forms appear and dissolve. Suddenly one sees a hall of records without walls. An old man hands you a large book, a record of the individual for whom is seeking the information. Trance Channeling Rubbing your hands together activates and opens the channel. Trance channeling is like taking time out, as in meditation, to honor and focus exclusively upon a state of awareness that's always there. Learning Self-Hypnosis Get into a comfortable position and take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. Do this five to seven times, inhaling deeply, exhaling long and slow, and completely. Focus on your arm. Notice anything about your arm that might feel like heaviness and say to yourself, my right arm is heavy. Don't do anything with your arm, just lie there. Repeat the phrase several times. Allow yourself to experience your arm as feeling heavy. As you imagine your arm feeling heavy, notice how you let it go and relax in your right arm. You are responding to suggestion. After about a minute, move on to your left arm and repeat the process, then say, my arms are heavy. Move on to your legs, right leg, left leg, both legs. Finally, spread your focus out over your arms and legs. Say, my arms and legs are heavy. The more you let it go and relax, the more you are responding to suggestion, and the more you are becoming absorbed in a self-hypnotic trance. Level 2. Repeat the above process only using the word warm instead. My right arm is warm. Then at the end say, my arms and legs are heavy and warm. Level 3. Begin to focus on your breath. Watch your breath without interfering with anything and say, it breathes me. By now you have become very relaxed. You will notice your thinking is hazier, and you may experience spontaneous daydreams, or have a tendency to fall asleep. You're bordering on the sleep state. You're beginning to directly experience the region of the subconscious mind. Now role play with your higher self. Chapter 12. The Channel of Cooperation in a Group. Today's Affirmation. Whenever my thoughts are not in alignment with my purpose, the universal force sends me a sign. As each star in the sky gives its own illumination of the darkness, each of us functions as a portion of God's awareness. Each of us functions as a unique channel of God's consciousness. A group channels an artificial ghost. Cooperation is an excellent form of channeling. We set aside exclusive focus on ourselves and act in harmony with others toward a common goal. Learning to cooperate in a group is a good way to learn channeling. Conjuring up Philip, the artificial ghost. Members of a Toronto Society for Psychical Research conducted an experiment trying to create an artificial ghost, and they succeeded. They began by inventing a fictitious character named Philip. Each person took turns adding details and info 
to this make-believe story. For over a year they met once a week and sat in meditation trying to channel Philip to no avail. In the second year they tried a different approach. It was suggested that by creating an informal social event where they were laughing, singing and telling jokes and having fun, Philip would be more likely to show up. After the fourth session they heard a rapping on the table. It was Philip, the artificial ghost. Philip could not only rap the table, but he could lift it up and move it across the room. He could also control what stayed on the table and what fell off when he turned the table upside down. The group noted that Philip showed no more knowledge of himself than the group had created of him. Philip always remained faithful to their imagination, not to the facts of that era. Philip was clearly not a spirit. They interpreted Philip as an artificially created thought form. This creation of their group mind was capable of creating quite dramatic and seemingly intelligent physical phenomena. The Toronto experiment instructed a second group of people to copy this experiment. They created the Lilith with identical results. What is the significance of the Philip experiment? We certainly see some suggestive evidence about the reality of thought forms and their ability to mimic the presence of an actual spirit. It also shows the power of group energy working cooperatively to channel. The Channel of Cooperation The first step in developing psychic ability is to learn how to cooperate within a group. Nature interacts in an overall pattern of cooperation. Rediscovering the spirit of cooperation actually places us more closely aligned with the consciousness that promotes our better channeling. The act of cooperation attunes us to the transpersonal level of our existence, joined with the rest of creation in a unitary expression. We as lights in thee. Yes, we have the group, as a group, as gathered here, seeking to be a channel that they, as a group, as individuals, may be, and give, the light to the waiting world. First, let each prepare themselves and receive that as will be given unto each in their respective sphere of development, of desire, of ability. The first lesson, as has been given, learn what it means to cooperate in one mind, in God's way. For as each would prepare themselves, in meditating day and night, and what wilt thou have me do, O Lord? And the answer will be definite, clear to each, as are gathered here. Will they seek in his name? For he is among you in this present hour. For all as seek are in that attitude of prayer. The interpretation of this prayer is as follows. Seek to know God, to know ourselves, and one another, and to be able to express that knowledge in the world as a group and as an individual. Channel through the way you live. You're developing awareness of your individual mirroring of God. We are as lights in God. As each star in the sky gives its own illumination of the darkness, each of us functions as a portion of God's awareness. Each of us is a unique channel of God's consciousness. The Dream Helper Ceremony Gather some people together for an overnight healing service. This doesn't necessarily need to be done under the same roof, but it certainly could be more fun that way. Ask, who among us is feeling troubled by a specific problem and is willing to ask the group for help? Don't reveal the nature of the problem until the next morning. After everyone's dreams have been shared, then you can reveal the issue. Then the person with the problem leads the group in a silent meditation, and then everyone prepares for bed. Be sure to say, Tonight your dreams belong to someone else. Don't lose them or censor any dream material you may recall. In the morning, oftentimes, the dreamers don't think they've had dreams related to the person's problem at all. After everyone shares, and the person with the issue shares, you begin to see the connections and relatedness of the symbolism and images. It is as if before going to sleep, each person engages his or her instinctive, projective empathy to intuit that aspect of the volunteer's undisclosed problem that corresponds naturally with an unreconciled issue within the person's own life. This technique is a powerful group ceremony for channeling dream guidance. It gives the group an opportunity to function as a psychic consultant, or group oracle of healing. 
more effective than a psychic reading. It's a great way for a group to be a channel of blessings to someone in need, while at the same time learning something about themselves. People sharing of themselves with one another can channel a fountain of enlightenment. The Cotton Ball Getting to Know You Exercise to use with a group of strangers Take turns introducing yourself, but rather than saying anything personal, the person merely says, Mary had a little lamb. While saying this, the person imagines a positive scene in their mind that expresses something in their life. The group empathetically attunes to the sound of the person's voice and monitors their own spontaneous reaction. Contemplate for one minute on the person's voice vibration. Share any images, colors, feelings, or words that came. Notice common themes coming up amongst the group. Try to guess the nature of the scene the person was imagining. The group is usually wrong, although one person may hit on it. But the group does seem to be able to tune into some aspect of the person's life. This usually aligns with some commonality the person has with the focal person. For example, if the focal person was a teacher, the teacher in the group is able to pick that up. The Cotton Ball Ceremony a more profound level of channeling. In this, one person volunteers to ask the group for help with an undisclosed problem. This person takes a large wad of sterile cotton and rubs it between their hands while thinking about the problem. The rest of the group meditates. Next, the focal person breaks the cotton into small pieces and hands them out in the group. They hold the cotton in their hands and tune into their impressions. They verbalize whatever comes to mind. After everyone has shared, the focal person responds. Choir practice, channeling the sounds of the higher self. Jungle symphony exercise. You can make spontaneous sounds which free you to be yourself as well as raise your consciousness. In a small group, ask everyone to make the sound of their favorite animal all at the same time. Do this a few times until people are comfortable to sound out loudly and for as long as a minute. Then ask the animals to respond to each other's sounds, to interact, to communicate, to harmonize, as they would in nature. The Jungle Symphony is great fun and reminds people that their inner child still enjoys to play with sound. Additional Suggestions For the Individual For a week, make a commitment to ask this question daily. What would you have me do, God? Then at the end of the week, check in with yourself and see if you have been divinely inspired to do anything in your life. Chapter 13. Being a Channel of Healing Forces Today's Affirmation I believe there is a higher power working through me, which is helping me reach my goals. The best way to be a blessing to others. Be yourself, your real, true, spontaneous, essential, genuinely individual self. The Secret of the Green Thumb Luther Burbank was a famous horticulturist. He grew thornless cacti by telling the plants that they had nothing to fear and thus no need for such protection. The secret to improved plant breeding is love. Burbank was a practice meditator. It was by meditating with his plants that he had learned their secrets. He was able to heal the sick, as well as the plants. As we nurture our gardens, it rejuvenates us. Developing a green thumb is good for our health, as well as our plants. Your attitude while gardening is very important. Plants tended to by a grouchy gardener are hard on our digestion. Awareness of the unseen forces in creation. The invisible forces, the intelligence of creativity at work in plant life, in all life, is what the author calls the creative forces. Behave as if the God in all life mattered. Nature can instruct one on how to meditate and introduce us to invisible forces at work in the plants, animals, and insects. These overlighting intelligences are also known as fairies, devas, nature spirits, and elementals. Humans, being one with nature, contain these forces within as well as without. By merging intuitively with plants, becoming one with them, we can develop an awareness of the unseen forces at work. In setting yourself aside and joining the plant in the spirit of love, 
you become a channel of the creative energy in harmony with the plant. Through the plant exercise, you will be able to experience the energy pattern of the plant. Remember, what you want to see is within you. Awakening the Atomic Power of Healing Forces from Within There is consciousness all throughout our body. With a little training, subjects can make contact with individual cells within the body and affect their functioning. Each atom in the body has consciousness. When we meditate, the ideal we focus on shapes our awareness. This altering of our consciousness filters down to every cell in our body, every atom. For purposes of healing, use the ideal of Christ consciousness or being one with God. Allow the consciousness of every atom within the body to be filled with the awareness of God. The effect of this awareness is to alter the very rotary forces themselves within the heart of the atom. Remember that atoms are in instant communication with one another. They appear to communicate the information contained in the rotary activity within the atom. It is something about the spin of energy within the core of the atom that serves as an instantaneous telepathic link between all atoms. There is a link between the effect of the rotary forces within the atoms of the body during deep meditation to the opening of the channel of the healing forces of creation. Research on Channeled Healing Healing through prayer and the laying on of hands has a long history. Laying on of hands. A nuclear physicist tested the ability of the gifted healer, Olga Worrell, to affect bacteria growing in special laboratory containers. Olga would hold a container in her hands and attempt to retard or enhance the bacterial growth. Results proved that Olga could significantly affect bacterial growth in whichever direction she chose. Another study was done using inexperienced college students which showed they could also affect the growth. Another study was done where healers laid hands upon patients with real illnesses. The healers wore special gloves with water in the palms. The study showed that the water had been atomically altered. This proved that laying on of hands has the power to atomically alter the body. Power of Prayer A study was done that showed receiving prayer aided recovery. Patients receiving prayer recovered with significantly fewer complications than the patients who did not. Studies also show that this is effective even when the patient's own belief system is not relevant. They are unaware they are being prayed for. This shows that people can channel healing energies that operate on molecular structures themselves. The Glad Helpers View the development of healing ability not as a technique, but more as an opportunity for soul growth for the practitioner, as that person develops an awareness of oneness with God and is able to share that with others. The little things that count. To become channels of blessings, we must be willing to be active in life, ready to help when needed. It's the little things that count here. A smile is as valuable as a prayer. Lending a hand. Reaching out to touch someone. Giving a hug. Taking time to listen. Remember, it's not for us to fix or rescue people. Keep your thoughts positive. Our thoughts are not private, but affect those around us. Thinking kindly of others is as important as acting kindly toward others. Have faith in the process and leave the results to God. Nothing is achieved through self-doubt. Lay aside concerns about how you are doing. The best way to be a channel of blessings to others is by being yourself. Your real, true, spontaneous, essential, genuinely individual self. Plant Exercise Find a plant that attracts you and become that plant in your imagination. 1. Approach the plant, acknowledging that it is expressing its creative nature with no reservations. 2. Thank it for being willing to share its secrets. 3. Approaching it as a living being will put you in the proper frame of mind. 4. Example. Stand in front of a rose bush and imagine what it's like to be a rose bush to grow and blossom and wither and bloom again. 5. Allow the images to work themselves into your body. 6. Mimic the feeling of the plant in the rhythm and movements of your body. Dance with the plant. 7. Allow your mood to express itself in sound. Sing the plant song. 8. By giving yourself over to the spirit of life, express that life in your own way, openly, fully, 9. 
Become one with the plant. Join your spirit with the plant spirit. Breathe. In doing so, you are awakening universal life force energy. Chapter 14. Being Yourself, the Ultimate Form of Channeling. Today's Affirmation. My inner voice guides me in every moment. There is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any medium and be lost. The world will not have it. Martha Graham Channeling is not a substitute for being yourself. Be careful not to devalue any thoughts that aren't channeled in some psychic fashion. If we approach channeling as a substitute rather than as a means to become who we really are, it won't work. If we use channeling as a crutch to simply compensate for a low self-image rather than allowing it to touch and heal that problem, we cheat ourselves of the ultimate secret value of learning to be a channel. Allow your channeling to heal your self-doubts and teach you that you are okay and worthwhile. Channeling can teach self-esteem. Learning to step aside, to remove oneself as a block to the channel, is part of the process. Rather than being guarded about every word or action, you let go and talk and act freely, without forethought. Trust your immediate experience. Accept the first images that come to mind the first words that reach your lips. Let the ideal you have attuned to shine forth without hesitation or censorship. It's not easy being conscious of self without being self-conscious. Channeling involves learning self-acceptance. Again, learn to trust the value of your initial reactions, thoughts, or images. That's key. Serving an ideal opens the channel. Don't just be good. Be good for something. The greater and more genuine the person's need, the better the psychic functioning. It's the same for us. Whether we're serving a need or serving the expression of an ideal, when we respond to something more compelling than our own personal concerns, it's easier to set ourselves aside. Focusing on another person's needs can inspire our ingenuity. Expressing our love of a person in our work often helps us enjoy the process even more. The qualities we wish to have for ourselves we need to give to others. By becoming a channel of blessings, we ourselves are blessed. Service. The misunderstood secret. Testing channeled guidance by putting it into service, by applying it, helps test its validity and, if valid, increases our awareness of its truth. Serving others distracts our attention away from ourselves so that we more readily open ourselves to channel. Service is not only the purpose for channeling, it's also its stimulant and its means. Unfortunately, it's too easy to interpret service as a should rather than a natural, meaningful part of channeling. When we serve as an expression of our self-esteem, doing good feels good. Helper's high has been proven to be real. It is a definite feeling in the body a pleasant sensation accompanied by a mood that some describe as calm, warm, or glowing that comes from genuine altruism, service to others. Helper's high is the secret value of service, one of the blessings of being a channel. Become a conscious channel. The ultimate experience is not to channel. The ultimate experience is to become a conscious channel capable of giving and receiving inspirations and sharing them in a state of conscious awareness. Two things have been learned from channeling. One, it taught me that I was something more than I suspected, that there was a spirit inside that connected me to the rest of creation. Two, it taught me that being myself was potentially a perfectly fine way to channel that spirit. Trans channeling also demonstrated that the task ahead remains to learn how to love, to trust love, to be love, and to love being myself in my own way. More trans-channeling won't help me do that. To be yourself as only you can be. The only way you can be yourself 
is in the conscious awake state, acting in a totally spontaneous way. Know that when you go into trance, from the superconscious state of universal awareness, you'll sound pretty much like all the other trance channels who've tapped into that same source. When there's no ego at all, universal awareness and the same timeless, unchanging message come through. In some cases, it can almost be as much of a cliché as the familiar ego. Remember, each piece of nature serves its creator's purpose by being itself, quite simply. We serve the creator's purpose, and thus render our greatest service by knowing and sharing who we really are. No one else can be you the way you can. To express that spirit in your individual way is your purpose for being here. God intends for the world to have your expression. Use your intuition to know your soul's identity, your heart's true desire, and let it be. Know that finding a way to express yourself in service to the world is what you really want. It's the ultimate purpose and the blessing of channeling your higher self. The End <laughs>